attention to the screens. I grew up in Fraser Court's housing projects in South Dallas. I was raised by a single mother on welfare. My father was sentenced to 55 years in prison when I was nine months old. At the age of 14, I started a gang. By the time I was 20, I was locked up, ridden off, and deemed a menace to society. It was there in prison where I found redemption. And today, I'm rewriting my story. Becoming a father, building a business, restoring my neighborhood, sparking a movement, and taking control of my own destiny. Whoever said it couldn't be done only judged my past. I'm a new man, and today, there are people who believe in me. They believe in a comeback. Okay, um, you all have been wonderful. This is going to be uh, great, and we're, we're certainly hopeful that uh, this will show up on Morning Joe next week. Um, we're thrilled uh, to have Joe Scarborough and Mika Brzezinski from MSNBC's Morning Joe. Please welcome Joe and Mika. Come on, let's go. <laughs> Come on, quick. Quick You're on. Do you have How your mic? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Joe. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's Thank a great honor to be here. You know, uh, Mika, by the way, very, there's a big deal that Mika is here because usually on Saturday afternoons in New York City, it's usually when she's speaking to the Young Marxist League meeting up there. Okay. And I was wondering where you were to going. Break away, I was, that's where I was going. Got it. It's actually kind of, I have to say, this, I'm glad to be here. I was sitting in the back with Joe. We were listening to this. This is a Republican Party that could win the White House. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't see it out there. It's not what we're hearing, but good Lord. You know, it's very interesting uh, being a Republican sitting back there and ha listening to other members of the national press. A lot of people saying, we haven't heard this so much in 2015, but it is really, really impressive. And it's really the reason why I know you all became conservatives, why a lot of you became Republicans. The reason I did was because of people like Jack Kemp, because of people like Ronald Reagan, and What's so inspiring listening to this and listening to Speaker Ryan. By the way, how great does that sound? Speaker Ryan. When I, uh, when I first got to Congress, and I don't know if you guys knew it, but I was in Congress. When I first got to Congress, little Paul Ryan was 23 years old, and he was a staffer who was helping a group of us called the New Federalists who were trying to abolish four federal agencies. And yes, I can remember what the four federal agencies were. And I was impressed with the guy the first day. And so to turn on the TV set and see that our Republican Party has Paul Ryan as speaker is a very, very exciting thing. And he still looks 23. He still looks 23, you, by the, the way. You, on the other hand, But you know, 52. but I've gotten old, a little haggard, because I've got to work, you know, besides her every day. But, <laughs> I'm joking with you. But you know, the thing about Paul and the thing about Jack Kemp is these are the people, along with so many others that have been up here today, who made me a Republican. Because they, they didn't believe that we were speaking to 47% or 53%. Ronald Reagan believed, and Paul Ryan believes, and Jack Kemp believed that what we believe is not just relevant to 47% of Americans, it's relevant to 100% of Americans, and that it's not just as relevant to a 17-year-old Latino 
Working in South Central LA is a 65-year-old hedge fund manager in Greenwich, Connecticut. It's more relevant. What we believe lifts 100% of Americans. And that's why I'm so honored to be here with you guys today, why Mika's so honored to be here and listen to this side of the Republican Party that can take back the White House and will take back the White House. With that, Mika, why don't we introduce we have our a distinguished panel. panel. We'll start with Paul Ryan, Speaker of the House, featured in the Opportunity Lives comeback series that he tells took off the his story. Beard. It's beautiful. No beard. No beard. Joe, you're there. Paul, you're Here's there. Okay. All right. uh, so Paul Ryan's with us. Also, Bob Woodson, founder and president of the Center for Neighborhood Enterprise, known as the godfather of the movement to empower neighborhood-based organizations. Right. And Arthur Brooks, president of the American Enterprise Institute. We are calling this, by the way, Thank we're going to be Thanks. calling this what we learned today. So Joe, take it away. Paul, I want to start with what Mika told me uh, as we were listening to you guys, listening to you moderate several of these panels. She said, I'm a Democrat. This Republican Party could win the White House going away. Talk about that. Well, I don't see and, this. And why we don't see that every day. Well, hopefully you'll see it more and more and more because we have our country locked in a very, very bad trajectory and we're on the wrong track. Deeper poverty, more persistent poverty, a weak economy, the world on fire. I won't get into all of the issues, but if we don't have a vibrant, inclusive, inspiring, exciting, majoritarian Republican Party, we will not be able to fix these problems party, and get us on the right party track. who, as you always say, has to be for something. That's right. Not against something. So, so what are we for? What have we learned today? So what you're learning today is that we are not just an opposition party, but we are also a proposition party. And what you're learning today is that, and look, I'm not trying to make this, this shouldn't really be about party. And by the way, um, wouldn't you, if you were a person, um, wouldn't you like have both parties compete for your vote, no matter who you are and where you live and what zip code you're in in America? I mean, so. So, what, so you're trying to tell me there's hope even for Mika. There's even hope for Mika. So without trying to be partisan, I think we owe people an alternative. And I think we have better ideas with principles that offer better, better solutions. And we need to talk about those solutions. The other thing we need to do, and this is what my friend here taught me, is we need to listen. We need to go experience. We need to go see what people are experiencing, listen, hear, and learn. And then when we find great ideas and good success stories, back them, get behind them, empower them, and then take those lessons and affect them as policymakers. And that's basically what this is all about. So Bob, how do we take what we hear today, what we learn from think tanks, what we debate on college campuses, and apply it to the reality Real of life. the ground and make a difference in people's lives? Well, first of all, we've got to do what, um, what Paul and others said. We've got to go and listen. I think, uh, I think Beth Reinhardt, the Wall Street Journal is here, did an article. Last presidential election, uh, neither candidate visited any of the 100 poorest counties in the country. Paul changed that. And so it is important to go and listen, but also that we, we should stop distinguishing ourselves by what we're against. Mm -hmm. People are not motivated to change by always reminding them of injuries to be avoided. They want to know victories that are possible. We also should go among the poor and deal not with what people don't have, but what are they doing with what's left? And so uh, we should look at the capacity of the poor. Go in and, and, and ask not how many people in these low-income neighborhoods are raising children that are dropping out of jail and drugs, on, uh, in, in drugs, but how many are raising children that are not dropping out of school or in jail and drugs. They are the real source of new knowledge and innovation about how to address poverty. Boy, Meek, I'll tell you what, you know, what we've seen uh, in Harlem, in Harlem, right. at a lot of the charter schools, from a lot of the students, 
It's nothing short of extraordinary. It is. And when you look at the victories that are possible, it is, though, hard not to avoid some of the systemic problems um, from the jail system to other problems, especially pertaining to race even, that are holding Americans back. Arthur, can you talk a little bit on that? Yeah, I mean, it, it's pretty, it's pretty encouraging, you know, sitting through these panels. And by the way, great job, Paul. I mean, this yeah. is a long slog on, yeah. on this. <laughs> but Congress. <laughs> but seriously, I mean, keeping the the tenor up, and it's really all about ideas. It's terrific. We heard a bunch of great policy ideas. As a guy who runs a think tank, this is extremely encouraging. I'm really optimistic. But there's something else that comes through when we're talking about these ideas. It's clear that that Paul and Tim and these candidates, they go beyond just the what of trying to figure out what we need to do about poverty, not just, okay, the expansion of the earned income tax credit, something like this. What we started to hear a little bit is an optimistic philosophy about the poor as people. See, Bob just mentioned this. It's very important to go where poor people are and talk to them as our brothers and sisters, to see them as people. What's happened is, is kind of interesting. You know, when, when I was a child, from then until now, over the war on poverty, this, the metastasis of big government programs that have made sort of less, uh, less poverty, less material poverty, but more dependency, something really bad for the soul, we as people have started to see poor people as liabilities to manage. And, and that's a terrible thing. When, when, you, when, you, when you, anybody doesn't want to feel like a liability, we, we're assets. We're at, every single one of us has our oar in the water and we deserve to be part of the American family and be part of progress and part of the solutions that, that, that are but, troubling but, this country. But Arthur, All of us, in, including in, in the, the poor. national media though. Beg your pardon. In the, whether it's in the national media, whether it's on the floor of, uh, of the House or the Senate, whether it's from the White House, success is always measured by spending more money in government right. programs. We as a country spend more money per student than any country on yeah. the planet. We spend more money per uh, hospital patient than any uh, 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 nation on the planet. And yet we fail miserably. How do we move beyond the national media the politicians, Washington, D.C., as measuring success by just pouring more money into failing systems. You, well, you don't measure the inputs into a welfare system. You measure the impacts in terms of people's lives. Now, the, the, the conservative movement has always been about impact. It's always been about actually seeing the results of things. The problem is that the conservative movement has not been involved enough in poverty and has t uh, given the entire territory over to the left. So the left, generally speaking, measures in terms of how much money you spend in the inputs. The right is about the impact. Okay, what do you expect if we give all the territory on poverty over to the left? They're going to waste three generations of poor people's lives. That's why we have to be in this game. When we go out of here, look, I mean, this is the real challenge. When we go out of here sometime in the next day or two days or week or two weeks, we're going to be confronted with actual poor people. What do we take away from this? The answer is our responsibility as conservatives to remember that the reason for the free enterprise system is to help poor people more. The reason for high levels of education and good family values and the faith that we have in God is so that we can help people who need us more. That's the kind of impact that we can have. It's the impact mentality that we need to bring to policy but, and to life. But, but Paul, I, but, in bringing that to policy, well, let, Bob. Yeah. But, well, let me ask you this, Bob, in bringing that to policy, we talk about the free enterprise system, and everybody thinks about how the rich are getting richer, the yeah. poor are getting poor, the system's rigged against not only the poorest Americans, but middle-class Americans. I think as conservatives, we've got to take responsibility for our contribution to that caricature of us. First of all, um, we have been on the forefront of, of like everyone else, and that is harvesting the, the failures of the poor and reporting on, on, on our reports, and then we merchandise that we have created a commodity out of the poor, mm. where 70 cents of every dollar goes not to the poor, but those who serve poor people they ask not which problems are solvable, but which ones are fundable. And it's the same truth. You'd be hard pressed to go to a Republican run state or Democratic run state and see any difference in how we treat the poor. There are structural reasons where, where when, you, when you create a commodity, it means that people profit 
from serving them. So we have professionally uh, uh, people whose income and careers depend upon other people being dependent, and they're conservative as well. So that's why what we've got to talk about is how do we structurally give the authority to the poor themselves, the leadership in these communities that Paul uh, visited, they are the ones who should be running these programs. But I don't see that. Bill Bennett said it. He says when, when liberals look at the poor, they see a sea of victims. When conservatives look at the poor, they see a sea of aliens. So, Mr. Speaker, um, off, you uh, saw this firsthand and have so many ideas, and yet one of your concepts is a little bit about the government perhaps having too much, sometimes needing to get out of the way. Yes. But isn't that you at this point? Yeah. And yeah. So well, how do, how do you, you navigate yeah. that? You are the government. Dude. <laughs> yeah. I never really looked at it like this, <laughs> and I still don't. I always see myself fighting it. Um, I think when you go back at the macro level and you see this 50-year experiment of this war on poverty, 80 programs, trillions spent, the philosophy behind that was, this is such a priority, it's so big, we're gonna make it in Washington. We're gonna, we're gonna create this bureaucracy and we're gonna have this program and then we're gonna have all this stuff and, and we're gonna get really smart experts out there who are gonna figure out how to do all of this. Well, that's basically the governing philosophy that's, that's taken over our federal government. It, it, and what it does is it ignores the individual. It, it ignores how people in their communities actually are. And it crowds out, well, like I said before, that space between ourselves and the government where we actually live our lives. It crowds out our communities, our civil society. What, you know, it, it crowds out our responsibilities. And it tells every other taxpayer out there who's not in poverty, this isn't your problem. You know, you just pay your taxes. Government's got this taken care of. Don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. That is wrong. And that is unfortunately what we've basically said and done for the last 50 years. So what we're trying to do is break this up. I think that philosophy, as well-intended as it may be, is paternalistic. I think it's condescending and arrogant. And it ignores the fact that in our communities are the answers. Mm -hmm. With people are the answers. And when you look at a person's problem in poverty, sometimes it's materialistic. Sometimes you just lost a job and you need a new one. That's what economic growth fixes. But a lot of these problems are so much deeper than that. Yeah. And it requires another person to help them or a group of people to help them. Some bureaucrat in Washington isn't that answer. And so how do we break up this government monopoly, re-engage the citizenry, reignite the notion that we all people, in each and every one of us, have a role to play to, to in our communities and how do we revive civil society and stop government from displacing it. And the way I argue about this is, this is not a budget cutting exercise. This, take the same amount of money. It, it should be a life saving exercise and that means the government can provide resources. It can be the supply lines, but it should not be the front lines in the war on poverty. People, communities, churches, civic groups, you name it, that's the front lines. Mm -hmm. That's so, the kind of attitude I think we have to have. Mm -hmm. But we are, go ahead. Look. So Arthur, let me ask you, mm -hmm. we've had a lot of presidential candidates uh, come on stage. Yep. Beak and I interviewed uh, some of them backstage afterwards. And we asked, what's the one thing you would do to combat poverty? What's the big idea? Because you know, there are only so many things that you can prioritize when you step into that office or when you're Speaker of the House. If you had the ear of the next president, like you have the ear of the Speaker of the House, what would you tell them to get together on? And what's the one big idea to help the poorest among us? The, 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 the most important thing to be thinking about always when you're talking about people who are poor in America today is work. It's always work. You know, it's funny, it's, uh, there are two kinds of people. There are people who believe that work is a blessing and people who think that work is a punishment. And you gotta figure out which one you are. I mean, on the, on the left, there are all kinds of people who say, we shouldn't have work requirements on food stamps because you know, we shouldn't punish the poor. Work's not a punishment. And there are all kinds of people on the right who say, you know what, I'm gonna sock it to them by making work requirements as if work were a punishment. This is a mistake. We need policies and we need a philosophy that says that, you know, look, and, and let me go all think tank on you. There are four sources of happiness. Faith, family, community, and work. Those are the four things in all of our lives that give us happiness. Are the poor different? Nah, they're us. They're 
there, you know, this is what we're all built on. You know, the, look at the, the foundations of the Constitution and look at the, the founding documents. Mm -hmm. And basically, you know what they're saying? The, the, the pursuit of happiness, who's it for? It's for the riffraff that we're coming into this country. You know who the riffraff are? Us. We're just ambitious riffraff. That's what America's all about. That's the beauty of it. And if we can't see that faith, family, community, and especially work are the basis of a happy life for poor people, just as they are for us, then we're treating them as the other, and that's the basis of our problems. All public policy, all philosophy has to start with the idea of the meaning of good work. And yeah, and I'll ask I, you the same okay, question. Uh, You've got the Well, I, re I reject the notion the that work is the answer for poverty. It's work is the answer for people in the first two categories of poverty, those who are just broke. The factory is closed, but their character's intact. But for the people in category four who are poor because Which of moral four? failings, yes. they're moral failings, they're drug addicts, they're prostitutes, they're engaging in predatory lifestyles. A job for people like that is not available to them. So what they need is transformation. We need to acknowledge that people have character deficits. But that doesn't mean because they do, they cannot be redeemed. Our grassroots leaders that Paul has met around this country have specialized in bringing about a major redemption and, and, and transformation of some of these very broken people only after they have gone through a process of transformation and redemption can they take advantage of a job or training in anything. But a job does not create redemptive uh, uh, redemption in a person. And so, the, but, so what we need to do is provide the resources in those low-income neighborhoods to those indigenous leaders that have demonstrated that they, they have the ability to be moral mentors and character coaches. And we need to empower them and therefore attach resources, opportunity to a process of personal redemption and transformation. So g give us the four there are four categories. There are people who are just broke. They, they, they lost their job. A factory's moved out. Category two are the poor people who characters intact, but they, as you said, they look at the disincentives to work, and therefore they make a decision to withdraw from the, because it, the price is too high. Category three would be people who are physically or mentally disabled. We need to find a way of taking care of them. Category four is the poor person is poor because they engaged in risky behavior. They are the ones that are filling the jails and they are the ones who are c committing the crime. The people that the Center for Neighborhood Enterprise serves and the people you met are the people who specialize in category four. They're in some of the most drug infested, crime ridden neighborhoods and they have created islands of excellence in these neighborhoods. When Jack Kemp helped us, public housing uh, resident management. For 10 years, Jack uh, was, helped us generate within the, a crime-ridden public housing building. They drove out the drug dealers. They sent 600 kids to college. And yet, not one researcher from left or right ever came in that community to examine what these groups did uh, but, 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 to but, but help but talk, themselves. But talk about that. Talk about what Jack Kemp did in helping you in, in, in finding the moral leaders that could help take a really strong leadership role and make a difference in that community? Well, first of all, Jack came at a time when it wasn't a politically expedient for him to do so. And every, all of his friends said, why do you care about these people? They don't vote for us. But Jack was a man of principle. He said, as Paul Ryan did, when I asked him, why do you want to go on this tour? He said, because I'm deeply concerned about this nation. And so what Jack did, he used his consider considerable uh, 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 celebrity to listen to the grassroots leaders. He traveled with me, as Paul has done, to public housing. He said, Bob, I I'm willing to sponsor legislation. I can get you 100 Republicans if you get me one Democrat. And I am... <laughs> I uh, recruited Walter Fauntroy, uh, who co-sponsored seven amendments to the Housing Act, and we won 93 to zero in the Senate and four, over 400 in the House. Mm -hmm. And Ronald Reagan signed it into law, flanked by myself and six resident leaders. I thought the Republican Party was on its way to redemption itself. <laughs> but what they did was they walked away from it. Yeah. They went back to just whining and complaining about what the left is doing. 
Instead, and Paul is really, I think, uh, I'm so encouraged because he has done the same thing. He has visited more low-income, high-crime neighborhoods than any member of the Black Caucus even. Well, <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> and, 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 but, he's, but what he's doing, he went there and said, I don't want any press. But once he's there, I said, Paul, you have got to uh, explain. We, we did this video because I said, you've got to show the people what you saw. And he is, he is I keep saying to him, I keep expecting him to blow up in the community. That means become a celebrity and walk away from it. But he has not done that the way other Republicans no, have I'll, I'll tell you, when I worked with him, mm. he was such a diva. diva. Yeah. He would be like, seriously? <laughs> All about the hair. Own? No, just the opposite, actually. <laughs> So, um, so, so, Paul, uh, how do you, you know, Arthur was talking about how Republicans, conservatives have, other than people like Jack Kemp and yourself, yeah. have failed miserably in focusing on the truly disadvantaged. How are you getting the message back to your brothers and sisters in the Republican caucus <clears throat> about how important this issue is, not for political no, gain, that, but for a moral responsibility? It, we have a moral obligation. Uh, most of us are driven to that by our faith. But, but even still, if you take a look at this country, how polarized it is, how so many people are slipping through the cracks, how we, we were raised to think that this American idea is beautiful and it's accessible and everyone can get it. But there are so many people who just don't buy that anymore. It's it, it, for generations now. And if that's what continues on, then we will lose what's so precious about this country. We'll become France without an America to back it up. <laughs> and so, you know. I, I, wow. I, I've got to say Nothing recently, against the French. I've got to say recently, the French have wondered why America yeah, hasn't been there to back it up. Isn't that something? I tell you, yeah, that's that amazing. Sad? Yeah, it really is. But, but we digress. But the point, I guess I'd say, is the reason I... See, the French jokes don't work anymore yeah, with Barack right. Obama's yeah, yeah, yeah. president. But go all ahead. right, you too. So <laughs> the reason I wanted to go learn after elections without press was just to, to experience and to learn and to see if the party of Kemp and the party of Reagan can take the same principles, the same principles, which is what we all purport to believe in, and see them on display, see them being driven and put into place and to see the results and then see if we can go apply them writ large and get all conservatives to do so. And that's what we're trying to do here. And if we can succeed in doing that and then have a conversation in this country where we truly offer the country a better way forward, a real agenda a, that it is based on these principles, then the way I see it is we can give the people of this country the choice. Right. What, do you, what kind of country do you want? What do you want us to be? We shouldn't be sitting here trying to cut deals in Washington and, and just going to their lowest common denominator. Right. If we really think we're on the wrong track, which we do, then we have to snap ourselves out of that and say, here's what this new track looks like. And you can't do that if you're leaving the poor behind. Right. You can't reignite the American idea, economic growth, prosperity, security, if we're letting people continue to slip through the cracks. And, and the point he's making about all the very types of poverty there are some of it is really deep and very intractable. That's the one we should go focus on. That's the one that we have to get our, get our minds around. And what we learn is our policies, our principles are perfect. They're beautiful because they empower those who are on the ground doing it. You know, Arthur. I remember Arthur, I, I, I think it was 1979. I was in Northwest Florida uh, and finished watching the Atlanta Falcons lose another football game on, <laughs> on CBS. And I was walking away from the TV, and then I saw a tease for 60 Minutes, and it was about this guy named Jack Kemp. And they were talking about how in 1980, who knows, maybe uh, he could be a force in, in, in presidential politics. And I stopped and watched him, and I was transfixed. And... <clears throat> Sure enough, 60 Minutes was right. The guy transformed Republican politics for the next 25, 30 years. Could you talk in closing about how Jack Kemp is relevant not only to our movement and to our party, but to our country in 2016? Yeah, thanks. Um, and thanks for asking that question about the great, the great Jack Kemp. Um, Look, they're just talking about politics here for a second. We're talking about things that are bigger. We're talking about the, the moral imperative of helping our brothers and sisters. But let's talk about politics here for a second. Is this 
orientation helpful? Is what Paul doing going to help the Republican Party? There's data on this, my friends. You are right in your hearts, because here's how it works. We know that if conservatives capture the traits that are typically associated with liberals, empathy and compassion, that fact will swing independent, persuadable voters by 10 That's percentage right. points to the right. That's not something that can win. It's the only thing that will. <laughs> What's written on your heart will win the election. And the country will come back to conservative ideas and we'll be able to help those people. You gotta be a warrior for this stuff. Remember Jack Kemp, not just because what he did was right. You know, the first vote for a Republican ticket I ever cast was in 1996 because Jack Kemp was on that ticket. I said, oh, that's what I think, right? <laughs> we get to do that again and win to boot, but we gotta do it together. And thank God for Paul Ryan. But that's, that so, Bob, your final thoughts on why it's important to First capture. of all, can you believe what a wonk he is? I know. He, he reduced compassion to a percentage. Seriously. I'm very <laughs> I've been, I got to say, I'm very impressed because I'm not good with numbers. I went to the University of Alabama, yeah. you know. But then again, That's when tight. you go to Alabama, you don't have to be good at math because every year, we only have to count to number one. Yeah. Roll Tide! Oh my God, you don't Roll know tide. how many times I've heard that. How many Clemson oh fans God. are out there? Yeah. Yeah. God bless your hearts. Sweet. Poor things. You don't anyway. need to pander uh, now. Okay. I'm, no, I'm not pandering. So, <laughs> just no, I was talking the to them. monologue you've got going here. Yeah. All right, so Bob, uh, final thoughts on, on Jack Kemp's legacy and capture. Well, for one thing, Jack formed really close relationships. I remember saying to Jack when he became HUD secretary, I said, when you go to Chicago, you don't go downtown to Kiwanis, you go to public housing where they had big signs up. I'm saying, you invite these liberal mayors because they'd never been there. <laughs> and then Jack would do that and they were embarrassed and always came. But also, if you look at uh, Jack Kemp has never been, there's no protest against Jack because when he came to Bromley Heath in Boston, a group of uh, people came in a bus, uh, 12 of the brothers stopped them as they were pulling up and said, no, you all got to get out of here. <laughs> because Jack had that kind of relationship that he was never picketed. Every time he gave testimony, you will see all black faces and brown faces because we filled the room three hours before Jack would testify. <laughs> so every time Jack testified, you see faces behind him shaking his head. My point is, when you show up for grassroots leaders, they are not sunny day friends, they will show up for you. And Jack had a passionate support among low income people because of he was the, the kind of person that showed up for them and they showed up for him. It's beautiful. You know, Paul Ryan made a commitment when he became Speaker of the House and I was one of a thousand people, a million people praying that he would become Speaker of the House. And he said, I'm gonna put my family first and I don't think I can be Speaker while putting my family first. He somehow figured out how to do it, but he told the Republican Party, I will do it, but I will be home every weekend with my children. I want you guys to know, this is the one Saturday in a year that Paul hasn't been home with his family because that's what Jack Kemp means to him. Mm. And I want you, Paul, to close by talking about Jack Kemp's legacy, not only for 2016, but for the next 40 years. Well, I've got to go catch a flight home in a minute, so. <laughs> <laughs> Hurry. <laughs> uh, Jack, the Jack Kemp is who drew me into public service. Um, he's the one who inspired me by taking these beautiful principles, freedom, liberty, free enterprise, self-determination, government by consent of the governed, the great lesson of the American idea and our natural God-given rights. He's, these things were written on paper in our founding. These, but he, what Jack Kemp did to me personally is breathe life into them, right. to see what they look like, to see how they feel, to see how they actually still are as relevant today as ever before and more, more important than that, that he breathed life into him, what he did was he breathed life into it to everybody. He, he would go into inner cities to community <laughs> and proselytize about limited government and free enterprise and how it was uplifting and how it made a difference and how it could help heal the country. So Jack Kemp 
took our party, and he added it to Ronald Reagan's agenda, which is a security agenda at the time, and gave us Reaganomics, gave us Morning in America, gave us an optimistic, inspiring, inclusive majority party. And it's that spirit, that, that belief, that, that, that enthusiasm, that infectious enthusiasm uh, that got me where I am and got me into this in the first place. Arthur Brooks, Bob Woodson, Speaker Paul Ryan. Thank you, Thank you. very Thank you. much. Hey, well nice job, brother. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Go hey. catch that flight. Thank, Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, no. Our Thank pleasure. You, Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. You're wonderful. Thank you, you're wonderful. Thank you very much. We'd love to right. do anything we yeah, can to help stop. you. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. We got to get a beautiful job. We have more to do here. Uh, we have another panel, very distinguished. Uh, you might know our next guest. You just might know him. Senator Tim Scott, co-moderator right. of the Camp Forum. Grew up in a poor single parent household in North Charleston. Served in the U.S. House from 2011 to 2013. Tim Scott. Put him in the middle. We have Monica Watts. She's from Southeast Washington, D.C. Grew up in gang violence, lost two brothers, two boyfriends, and many friends and neighbors to violence. She got involved with an anti-gang nonprofit and became the first college graduate in her family. Also with us, we have Jimmy Kemp, president of the Jack Kemp Foundation, son of Jack Kemp. Great to have you all with us. I've got to say, Mika. Yes. We begin this panel with a serious problem. Uh-oh. Absolutely. The senator has told me oh. he cannot move forward until we resolve the crisis of Monday night. Absolutely. Well, Alabama or Clemson. Senator, you have the floor. Thank Please. you very much. I, I realize you're from Alabama, and I even they had the group Alabama singing a song today. Roll Tide. Roll Tide. It was not the one they were singing. Uh, it was Sweet Home Alabama, yeah. because when it's all over, the only place will be left will be Sweet Home Alabama, oh. because Clemson is going to win by two touchdowns. Oh. <laughs> He's starting out dirty. I believe in miracles. <laughs> <laughs> well, my man, nice. that would be a miracle. Uh, uh, but oh. We shall see. Yes. Um, you know, right. I, uh, your story's extraordinary, uh, and it's a story that unfortunately my party, your party, yeah. hasn't heard enough about. Um, talk about the challenges that the Republican Party has, reaching out to the truly disadvantaged that feel like we aren't listening, we don't care, we don't have solutions, yeah. and that there aren't enough Jack Kemp's in our, in our midst. We definitely need to do a better job of articulating our conviction that our conservative principles work. The reason why I'm so compassionate about it is because I've seen it firsthand as a kid who was struggling in high school, flunking out as a freshman, mm. meeting a conservative mentor, John Moniz, who ran the local Chick-fil-A, comes into my life and he starts teaching me about entrepreneurship, about dreaming the American dream, not just owning a home, but being an employer, not just an employee. All that resonated in me. It helped to focus and harness my energy in a positive way. What we as Republicans need to do is get out of our house, get out of our car, and drive in walk into neighborhoods where they're desperate for hope. What we've found in the last seven years is if you're desperate for hope, the federal government has not served you well. The policies have been an abysmal failure for people trapped in poverty. It is now time for real leadership on the issues of poverty to take a stand. They work every single time. And by, by the way, Chick-fil-A. Yeah. We finally got one in Manhattan. <laughs> I've got to, He's so I, happy. I, I, I've got to tell you, my southern children have never been happier. Oh. No. So, but and you have proven that, that all good <laughs> things begin at Chick-fil-A. There it's you early go. Early. All right. <laughs> Monica, we, want, uh, we would love if you could to share your story. Um, certainly a very tough road, especially in the beginning, right? Yes. Um, like majority of most um, African American families that come from public housing have faced some similar issues as me. Um, I was homeless. My mother and father was crack addicts, so I came from an addict family and home, so it was a dysfunctional environment. So when you come from them type of environment, the community is forced to raise you and guide you and go um, to the right direction and the way you should act or they basically condition your mind to say this is the way you should be based on what you see in the community. So 
I came across to came in contact with role models and community leaderships that actually got me to the next step to network to get to know people that put me in position where I can be able to help and reach my full capacity. So I really thank the people that I came in contact with that came into my community with the programs and assisted me to be the best that I can. How many kids in your family? Well, my parents had seven kids. Um, two of my brothers passed away now. One of my brothers in jail on his 12th year murder, a murder charge. Two of my sisters are arrested, locked up. Mm. And my last sister, she's, I don't know where she's at because she was arrested when we was young. So how were you able to break through? How, how were you able to get to a point in your life where you're graduating from college, where you're looking at a future? Um, basically, believing in something higher than yourself mm. or an individual and coming in contact with people that constantly motivate you and encourage you and don't let down on you just because you make a mistake. This constantly stay around you and motivate you and push you, even if you fall or you make a mistake. Just genuine people being around me, so that's helped me be the person I'm in today. And, and Mika, I, I met Monica through uh, Ron Moten. Um, Ron Moten is, uh, he's one of these poverty fighters uh, who has received some notoriety, um, but Ron is on the streets and he's engaging uh, young people who think that nobody cares about them. Um, and I think that's what the discussion was about today, is how we uh, make sure that we're empowering the folks who are on the ground and who are able to love when we know that government can't love. Um, and so Ron Moten investing, and I know there were other people as well, um, have given Monica a, a better opportunity than she had. And, uh, and this Kemp Forum is, this is a, a big event. We're, we're thrilled with it. We've done other Kemp Forums on issues that are really uh, significant on the ground. We've talked about ex returned citizens and entrepreneurship, uh, ex-convicts who have returned to society. Um, and we've been in Southeast DC. We took a Republican congressman and a Democratic congressman and had a conversation with them. We've talked about police community relations. Com police community relations is the front lines uh, of African Americans who come across uh, police and what a difficult job police officers have. Um, and th those are clearly complicated relationships. Um, and when something goes wrong, we have lots of problems. But we need to have conversations um, I know Governor Kasich has done a lot in Ohio talking about uh, how to manage some of those challenges. Um, they've had some really unfortunate incidents that haven't had this, some of the similar reactions. And here in South Carolina with Governor Haley uh, and her leadership, uh, that, that makes a difference. So, so Senator, how do, we, how do we do in Washington, D.C.? How do you guys do in Congress? What Jimmy did, getting Republicans, Democrats together, finding common ground and making progress on these issues. It's, it's difficult at times, but there is a reason to be hopeful. There's a silver lining in the quagmire pit known as Congress. And the reality of it is we found some common ground on some very important issues. One of the important issues that we found that common ground is really on, the, on crim, criminal justice reform. We've seen outside groups from the Koch, Koch brothers right. to the Heritage Foundation to the ACLU and the right. NAACP holding hands together. That's a miracle in and of itself right. to work on criminal justice reform. Now you have senators, you have folks on the far right, you have Grassley, myself, Cruz, Mike Lee, and others working on sentencing reform with folks on the far left, Schumer, Cory Booker, and others. So we found some common ground. It just is not celebrated very often. Another place that we're finding some common ground is on apprenticeship programs. The reality of it is, if we want to put people to work who may have already graduated, we're going to have to help people create incentives to hire folks so they can earn and learn the skill sets necessary to be productive in having a successful life. Monica, are you working now, or what are you doing now? Um, I'm currently a counselor, a mental health counselor in South Carolina, because I'm getting my master's in management and leadership at Western University, and I'm still looking for a better job with a better pay in South Carolina. <laughs> And, and Mika, if, if you don't mind, I, I'd like to ask Monica what she thought of today. Um, you heard a lot of candidates talking about issues, and uh, you know our premise is that doesn't happen often enough. What, what did you think? 
I thought it was very expressive for you all to um, point out that the system that y'all had to fix poverty wasn't working and that you all are now looking for a way to fix it and rebuild it and acknowledging the fact that it wasn't working and you all are able to come up with a system and listen and understand ways to make the system better and able to work for America as a whole. And, and, and Jimmy, talk about today. Yeah. And, and, and I want to follow up with what I said at the very beginning. Mika and I sat in the back. We watched a lot of this before we went and started interviewing the candidates. And, you know, Mika was blown away by this Republican Party, by this group of conservatives talking about poverty. You know, real conversations. Talking real conversations that we don't seem to be getting on the presidential campaign. Was that, was that part of the goal of this? And if that was the goal, did you accomplish it? And how do you continue after today spreading that message across the country? Well, I certainly appreciate, appreciate you two uh, being here. Um, and I think it's, it's important to have this type of civil competition of ideas. Um, and uh, you know, I know we're the number one trending Twitter uh, hashtag. Um, people are going to know about this, um, thanks to Senator Scott, Speaker Ryan. Uh, and we don't want to just do it with, uh, we did invite the Democratic candidates to come this evening and they weren't able to join us. Um, we had two Democratic mod moderators. We are going to try to do something with the Democrats down the road. I would love to do this with Democrats and Republicans. Wouldn't it be incredible to see that civil competition of ideas? That's what the country wants to, wants to hear. And as you said, John, I mean, John Kasich uh, said it here and says it all the time. We got to do that. Yeah. We, we, one, one party, one governing philosophy can't fix this problem. Your dad knew that better than anybody, right? Yeah. Well, the best line that he misappropriated um, and credited <laughs> to uh, President Lincoln was that you serve your party best when you serve your country first. Um, and I, 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 I think we saw a. Uh, a bunch of national political leaders who embody that phrase and, uh, and want to put America first, and they recognize that the American idea, the American dream, is not a reality if in our inner cities where we have young people like Monica coming out, if they don't have equality of opportunity, don't have a chance. If we can't help people like Ron Moten, um, who are helping kids who haven't had a chance, then the American idea is not a reality. And so connecting all these dots, that's what we want to do uh, with our Kemp Forum events and connect the political Sen parties. Senator, there's such a disconnect from what we see every day on the campaign trail yes. and what we're hearing in this forum. Uh, and uh, I, another thing I did say to Mika was, I said, when we were coming here, said, you're going to be seeing the cream of the crop this is the part of the Republican Party that's not against something. Absolutely. But that's for something, that wants to make a difference in the country. Um, talk about, though, how discouraging it is to watch the presidential campaign, to listen to the negativity, and how do you break through that? Well, there's no doubt that fear sells. And too often what we've seen on the stage at some of the debates is the selling of fear. It's easy to harness, it's easy to identify, uh, and it's very easy to divide our country in little feastums. That's a challenge that we have to overcome. Today, we overcame that. We saw candidates on this stage who are all competing for the exact same job, giving deference to each other's right. ideas. That has to happen. I hosted 12 of these candidates for president here in South Carolina, one at a time over the last several months. And I will tell you, as individuals, drilling down into the issues, you get a far better, a richer response, a more thorough response to the questions when you have the one-on-one. -on -one. It's as if in the middle of a debate, you throw some red meat on the floor, and, and, and they're all trying to tear it apart. But they're tearing each other apart to get there. Uh, what I thought that Monica said that was so important and it reinforces what Paul said on the stage today, Paul Ryan, Speaker Ryan. He have, you have two ears and one mouth. Go into the communities, listen. Monica didn't say anything about the government in her response to your oh. question, how did you get here? Her, her answer did not include the government. 
It's not that the government can't play some role in the process. I say there is a place for the government, so, obviously. I have two pages of solutions that we heard today from the earned income tax credit to tax reform to eliminating the burdensome regulations from Dodd-Frank. We heard a lot about school choice, charter schools. We talked a lot about criminal justice reform, mental health, drug addictions. So we have a lot of solutions, but the fact of the matter is if you start with solutions, you repel people. If you start with people, you attract solutions. And that's what we have to do as a party. I will say, I, I, I think, just as an aside, though, that's equally as important, the odds that you lived against, Monica, and now you have a college degree and you want an advanced degree. You have a job, you're looking for a better job. That comes from the concepts of today and Ron's inspiration, but also from you. Mm -hmm. I mean, Absolutely. you're amazing. We have a lot of kids. <laughs> we see a lot of kids that come through, work for us, whatever, who couldn't do half of what you've done. There's something really, really incredible uh, that you should take ownership of as well, for sure. Absolutely. What an incredible story, Jimmy. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that she has. It's Monica's story. And there, there are lots of uh, people out there. Each one of us, whether wherever we come from on the socioeconomic scale, each of us needs love um, and investment. And th one of the greatest points I believe my dad ever made was what Arthur said, I believe it was Arthur, who talked about people being our greatest resource. Um, and that reality is something that we all need to embrace. Uh, and it's difficult because we all know how, uh, how much challenge we face ourselves in ourselves. Um, but in this country, you're given a chance to be free and to uh, engage um, the world around you and to make decisions every day. Uh, and and the last thing I would say is a place, uh, is something I said earlier about the quality of political leaders. There's such disdain for Washington. Um, but when you get to know your leaders and you actually hear them interact and talk, um, they are extraordinary people who are motivated by public service. Um, and each of us is called to serve. And so each of us should play our part and get involved. Um, and, and Senator Scott is such an incredible example. It's great to have Speaker Ryan. He is, he is wonderful. But having an African-American Republican senator um, in Congress is a wonderful thing. He doesn't lead with that. Um, and we have two. Uh, not enough. There's Senator Booker. Um, and, but it shouldn't be such an anomaly. But we are proud uh, to have Senator Tim Scott um, serving the state of South Carolina. Thank you. Senator, um, I, I'd love to close with you, um, first of all, chanting roll tight as loud as you can, and yeah. after you do that, with the Kemp family here. Yes. And by the way, when I say the Kemp family, I'm talking about all of us. Yeah. Oh, Plus, pretty good. Plus the Mrs. Kemp, Kemp and, Brother, and, and the, the children and grandchildren. Yes. But talk about Jack Kemp's legacy in 2016, how it lives on with you, how it lives on with so many of us, and what the best thing we can do is moving forward as we leave this place today to make sure that it continues living on for the next generation with, with a bit of a revival, because it needs a revival right uh, more than ever. We are in need of a revival. <laughs> Can somebody say and amen? All, and, all, and all people said. Hallelujah. Amen. amen. Absolutely. It's good to be back in the South. Amen. Exactly right. I, I will tell you, certainly you can get involved with, the, with this movement at KempForum.com and become opportunity voters. One of the things I realized 20 years ago this year, in 1996, my dream came true. Bob Dole was running for president. He was looking for someone who would provide inspiration and hope to the, America, to the country. He leaned over and chose your dad. And I was excited because the one thing I knew about Jack Kemp was he loved with a colorblind kind of love. And I saw it on the football field when he was playing. I saw it in politics. And when I grew up in politics, I wanted to be like Jack. Because he had the compassion for people, but he had a mind for policy and numbers. So it wasn't one or the other. It was fusing the two together. Today, for America to be great, it's not for the Republican Party to be great. 
It's for the American country. It's for the U.S. to be great. Amen. That requires real leadership. And so for all of us, uh, if, 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 if Paul was still here, I'd say Wisconsinites, for all of us Kempites, it is incredibly important for us to feel and think. And Monica is a classic example of who we should follow in the direction of the Kemp legacy. Let's start there. Senator Scott, Monica Watts, Jimmy Kemp, thank you very much. Thank you thank guys you. so thank much. You. Go Tigers. <laughs> thank you. Good job. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you. Yeah. Great job. Oh, here, picture. Monica, picture, picture, picture real quick here. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much. Great, great job. job. Great job. You can just you wrap right? it up. Yeah. <laughs> and you can just wrap it up and say okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys much. so much. Well, guys, how many of you guys have had a great day? It's a wonderful day. Since you're standing, just remain standing. Let me just say, as, as a, the Senator for South Carolina, it has been my privilege to serve the citizens of South Carolina. It has been an amazing privilege to have presidential candidates come back to our state and talk about the issues that truly motivates people to listen. And if we have people listening, they'll be informed. And if they're informed, they're educated. If they're educated, they'll make the best decisions for the future of our country. I believe that 2016 will be a pivotal, pivotal and defining year for the nation. Let's make good choices by being opportunity voters. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Okay. Take this, yep. Take it